Talk to us about the difference between the Bitcoin spot ETF and the Bitcoin futures ETF. I know that there's a ton of debate as to whether the spot ETF should have gotten approved first or the futures. We get the futures. So what is the key differences between those two structures? Yeah, I, I could start. So I, I'll say, like, as we talk about this, the big the big thing here is it's a move from zero to one. So like, while we are, we think the spot product would be better for retail investors, probably, um, just because it's less confusing. Uh, the, it, as we mentioned, this is zero to one for the SEC, which is a big move, but it's not necessarily going to have a massive impact. And the other thing that I wanted to go back to is Eric talked about 24 trillion investor a, in advisor assets. Um, I mean, even if you take a tiny, tiny sliver of that, that's a lot of money that's going into Bitcoin, whether it's the futures ETF or the spot ETF. Um, but the big difference here is futures, you have to roll every month. So if you're holding the front month contract, right, that expires, so the next one expires on October 29th, you need to sell that contract that's going to expire on October 29th and buy the next contract that is November, which is November 30th, whatever the, whenever the contract ends. So basically what happens is in a typical market, like with oil and other things, there's storage costs. So that next contract is usually more expensive. That's called contango. So what you're doing is you're selling the lower price contract and buying the higher price. So every time you're losing a tiny bit of money um, and that can add up over the last year, that was about 36%. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's not nothing. Um, but it, we think we expect that to go down. I mean, Eric and I actually had a call this morning with Mike McGlone, who some people on here probably know. He's um, our commodity analyst, and he covers Bitcoin as well. And he thinks that's going to go way down. So right now, there's times where Contango is acting more like um, a commodity that's hard to store, like oil and something like that. That it's, it's hard to get this arbitrage because what you can do is it's called a cash and carry trade. You essentially are going to buy spot and sell the futures. And essentially, you can earn that difference when the, the futures contract that's coming up is more expensive. Um, but right, it's not that expensive to store Bitcoin and get Bitcoin like it is to go store barrels of oil. Um, so we think it's just going to be armed away eventually. Um, which, but even still, I mean, right now we're talking about 10 to 12 percent on average the last year or two, I think. Um, but Mike McGlone thinks it could go down to half that, 5 to 6 percent, which, again, isn't perfect. Obviously, a spot Bitcoin ETF doesn't have any of those roll costs, but for 5 to 6 percent. Um, for some of these people who are going to be using these products, especially traders um, and any long, along that lines, um, it's not that big of a deal, probably. Yeah, and, and let me add a couple of points here. So if you look at the pro funds, mutual fund that tracks Bitcoin futures, it's basically the prequel to Beto. It's already been out two and a half months. It's given us a nice case study for what Beto will do. It's only missed Bitcoin by about 1%, 60 basis points in two and a half months. That's very good. It's way better than we thought. It sort of feeds into McGlone's prediction that the role was only bad going way back and that going forward, especially with the incentive to ARB and how the ETF will bring all this money in, uh, we're looking at, a, it's probably more optimistic than we originally thought. And I, but still, let's say it's 5% a year. If something costs you 5% a year, that's kind of an annoying high fee. The other thing is advisors who, you know, it's possible if this thing tracks really well, over long periods, it could bring in some of those advisors. But remember, they're once bitten, twice shy. A lot of advisors bought VXX and learned the hard way what roll costs are. That's like 40% a year. VXX is brutal. Uh, USO could be 20% a year. So they probably, or UNG, there's a couple of them where they probably learn the hard way that anything that rolls futures is, uh, is could really, um, you could get your, the bet right. You could actually bet right on oil or natural gas and actually not win because of the product you chose. That's a big reputational sort of thing that these ETFs will have to overcome. That said, the ability to track Bitcoin on a daily and weekly basis is all that will matter to the trading crowd. And that's a real audience. And that's fine. There are ETFs that are for traders and some that are for long term. The question is, can this one actually build its audience beyond the trading crowd? And that roll cost will be a big uh, you know, variable in that. When you guys think about the grayscale uh, Bitcoin trust, GBTC, uh, it now has been confirmed that they're going to apply to have it converted to the spot ETF. Do we think that uh, just odds have increased now because futures have been approved, but we don't know much more than that? Or do you guys have other thoughts around uh, that application and the potential for it to be approved? Okay, I'll go. Uh, so I, I think, well, as I mentioned, this is zero to one for the SEC, right? So this is them. And, and as people have talked about, I mean, a lot of people out there 
Um, they talk about uh, no need for an ETF. Uh, their people are mad at, <laughs> at Gensler because of he's so negative towards crypto. But honestly, he knows his stuff. Like as much as people want to say that he doesn't, he really does know his stuff. And he's learning. And I, I really think that, as we mentioned, I think the spot product is a better product for most people that want to use this. I think they should have allowed both at the same time uh, and let investors put their money where they want to put their money, right? Let them democ let democracy pick the, the winning structure. Uh, but for whatever reason, get Gensler chose this. He uh, he highlights a few things. So one of the things is these futures products are under something called the 1940 Act, and we don't need to get in the nitty gritty here. But like essentially, it's a little bit. There's a little more consumer investor protections. There's a little more restrictions on what you can and can't do, versus something under the 1933 Act, which is an older Act that GBTC, if it converts, and these other spot products, which we have a bunch of filings out for, uh, they would fall under that 1933 Act. So. That's a big difference. But I, again, I think the, the part of the reason that Gensler went with this first is, one, there's obviously some animosity in Congress. Uh, Janet Yellen doesn't like Bitcoin from <laughs> everything we've seen. So I think this is almost like a CYOA, like a little bit of Gensler covering himself, because he can say, hey, we slowed the roll. Uh, we went with futures, which are already on a regulated market by the CFTC. Um, I didn't allow it right away. We're taking our time. So I think this is just him. Like, if anything goes wrong, he has all these cushions between him. Uh, whether Bitcoin gets cut and 70% people lose their money, which obviously is possible to happen. We've seen it happen plenty of times. So I think there's a whole bunch of reasons why we went this route. But I do think we're going to see a conversion at some point. I just don't know if it's going to be on GBTC's first try. And a little bit of background. So Van Eck, is the, they filed for this. So the whole process for those 1940 Act ETFs was a whole different scenario, which is why a lot of people weren't with Eric and I when we were calling for an October approval initially, because they go through a different process where it's just a 75-day period. GBTC and these other physical ETFs have to go through a separate process through something called a 19B4 application. They basically need to apply to the exchange and ask for a rule change to allow these ETFs to trade. Um, so that process... They, that's what you're, you're used to hearing all this like delay or deny or approve and all the other filings we've seen they either delayed or approved so they go 45 day process delay or uh, delay or approve delay or approve and it adds up to 240 days and that's after they get this 19 before application to hit the what's called the sec register so bitwise filed one on friday and it hasn't hit the register yet but after it hits that register then you have basically 240 days uh before the sec needs to make a decision um and we have van x spot etf that they filed through the 1933 Act on that 19B4 process and their final date of approval from filing on December 30th of 20, I think around December 30th, I don't know the exact date, 2020, is November 11th. So it's a long time before they can be approved. So even if GBTC applies for this application, it's not that 75-day process. I believe it's going to be that 240-day post 19B4 process. So it's going to be a long time, even if they get approved the first time. And we don't think any of these ETFs that are coming up on this approval window in this quarter are gonna get approved by the SEC because they were very, very explicit in wanting a 1940X product that only holds futures. Yeah, um, and let, me, um, let me jump in here because yes, it's a different process, it takes longer. The heart of the matter though is, and the problem for GBTC converting is it would have to convert to a 33X fund. And Gensler does not like that act. He is a really not into it. He likes the 40 Act. It has a, a myriad of more investor protection. So as James said, it's, it's a CYA kind of act. It, uh, he feels much more comfortable with it. So the question you have to ask yourself, yes, there's all these other technical delays, whatever, but is when will Gary Gensler get comfortable with the 33 Act? Or is it possible somehow Bitcoin is denoted as security? Because that means it could then go under the 40 Act because you have to be a security to get under that act. So which of those two things happen? I, I just don't see either of those things happening in any in the near term, even with, and then you add on the other delays. I just, I don't know. I, I feel like um, you're going to hear a lot of <laughs> talk about a conversion, but it, the question, if you hear anybody say this in your show, ask them, well, do you, are you saying that Gary Gensler is now comfortable with the 1933 act? That's the question they won't be able to answer.